We're talking about Inside Out 2 today. But guess what? This is going to be a double feature today because we're going to also touch into another film that surprisingly has more connections to this film than you'd think, and that is the one from Netflix on Hitman. But we're going to go into Inside Out 2 first. For those of you who don't remember, this film came out nine years ago. The original Inside Out came out nine years ago, and we just fell in love with joy, sadness, anger, fear, and disgust as they kind of went through the mind of Riley, who was a, a young girl who was kind of going through all this emotional turmoil. Well, now we've moved ahead. Riley is now a teenager. She turns 13. She's traveling through that emotional roller coaster of puberty, but also going to high school. And today, we not only get to talk a little bit about our familiar friends as far as the emotional element, but we are also introduced to a whole host of new emotions that's led by anxiety. So I'm really curious about this one. What emotion you have would describe how you felt about Inside Out 2? My first thought was I was excited. And I'm like, well, they didn't really oh. have excited, but maybe that's joy. I was excited to see the way, again, that they brought the different emotions to the table. So in the second one, we get introduced to anxiety, embarrassment, envy, ennui, all of the boredom. And I thought it was a really useful like thing, again, to say, okay, as you reach puberty, within the, the context of this movie, they see this flashing red light going off on the dial of, you know, the, the panel right. that controls all the emotions. And all of them, joy and sadness and the like, are going, what is happening here? We don't know what's going on. And there's this big puberty alarm, you know, going <laughs> off on the panel. And it's so funny as an, as an audience member to just like imagine your mind freaking out like that and hormones and all the things but as you're introduced into these new characters i thought yeah it's it's actually helpful again to see how these particular features start to become more present in your life as you get a little bit older and particularly in that puberty window having to navigate them for the first time understand them and decide how much of an impact they're going to have on your life i was excited you know, to see to see what they were doing with Riley's character this time around. Yeah, I love it. I love the fact that joy actually still comes back around for you because it definitely yeah. it's fascinating kind of how joy and, and all of the whole team before kind of goes through this journey throughout this whole story. And then also anxiety kind of takes over and it almost seems like a positive force at first, but then obviously things kind of go a little bit pear-shaped. I'd probably say the emotion that I kind of felt, there were two of them. One was kind of a calm um, that when I was going, oh, there's no agendas with this film. This is oh, one yeah. that will, I pretty much think that any family could go enjoy and sit down and watch and they're not gonna be sit there and surprised by something that kind of comes up that's just kind of a political statement, which get, moved me to gratefulness. I was just really grateful for, again, I felt like Pixar, they did, Elemental was great for me. I really enjoyed Elemental. I felt like they were finally getting their feet back again after, after COVID. And so this one, I felt like they're right back into it. They really kind of found their, their mojo, as it were, their emotional center, if you want. I found it fascinating, so I really was grateful on that front. This one really goes another step further, because it's not just mental health and emotions, but it talks about beliefs. And so I found that compelling, and I'd really love to hear what your thoughts are on it, because I really felt like the beliefs discussion was next level, especially when you're dealing with teenagers, when you're dealing with your friends and all the different things that kind of influence that beyond just your feelings. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that one. Yeah, I think that's really important that you pull that out because I think what this movie did really beautifully, and again, probably because it's looking at it in the formative years of our teen years and the way that a lot you know, of our core beliefs are either shaped yeah. or uh, developed in that window, it was really a really good thing, I think, that they started to look at that because they were explaining how, you know, our emotions and what we think, how they then start to shape our long-term memory and how our long-term memory then affects our, you know, core belief systems and our sense of self. So it's not just like, what do you believe about this about this particular topic? It's what do you believe about yourself? So right. for Riley's character as a child, and hopefully for many kids, you know, there's this belief in those years where you know, you're a good person and life is good and I'm good. And it, it was very much a conversation about goodness. And, and so Riley as a child really felt like she was a good person. I'm a good friend. And, you know, my parents right. can be proud of me, this sort of stuff. But then it was only in the teen years where that shift of thinking around whether or not she was still a good person. Am I a good friend? What can I, like, what do I need to do to find acceptance? You know, and, and interestingly, like these really nuanced beliefs about how you know if I'm friends with that person I won't be alone right and so then right. that comes back to how our emotions and how our beliefs are formed around those sorts of things like that need for community that desire for companionship it's like that was kind of explained really well it's like oh you know so, so a core belief is if I do this I won't be by myself which comes back to 
that need each of us have for sure. community. So our core beliefs can then be reflective of those kind of innate needs. I did again really like, I don't want to spoil it, so I'm not going to totally explain yeah, what happened, but yeah. I really do like where they landed with that sense of self and how identity is framed and how emotions fit within that. Because like you mentioned, this movie, one of its strengths is that it doesn't have some big social agenda, which I did find really refreshing for a kid's movie. And maybe- So nice. It was so nice. And maybe like, please Disney Pixar, maybe that's the secret sauce you needed to have a yes. successful movie again, is not to have it be so burdened by all of these big, ideas like not to say you know the world of our minds is a big enough idea to be it's grappling huge. with anyway you don't right. have to like make it anything more than that so yeah i really i don't know i really liked that beliefs were a conversation in this movie and also how they explain the way that beliefs are formed without addressing any specific um controversial kind of right. ideas or beliefs about anything that would feel like it was agenda laden Oh, this one goes on the watch list for me, definitely. Um, I mean, just because the humor is still there for the parents, the parents can enjoy this, but also the parents can connect because you're going, oh my word, this is what my teenage daughter or teenage child is going through right now. Yep. I think that this one definitely is on the watch list and worthwhile um, kind of for families to be able to get out and enjoy support. Go out to support a movie like this in cinemas because we need to really kind of back those. Now, now we're going to move to another film because we're moving to another one that's on Netflix right now. It's number one on Netflix. It's been there for about a week or two and it's been quite popular, but I look forward to kind of talking to you about this one because I think that we may kind of maybe differ on this one as far as our opinions of it. But this one is um, a fascinating story because it's actually brought to us by a kind of groundbreaking director, Richard Linkletter, who's known for kind of dazed and confused and other, other movies, but then also written by Glenn Powell, who Glenn Powell, if you kind of remember from Top Gun Maverick. He's kind of that pretty boy. You're kind of going, really? He's writing a, writing a film. And it's based on a true story of a man who's a philosophy professor who ends up getting pulled into kind of playing the part of a hitman to try and get people to kind of come in and try to hire him as a hitman. Hmm. And then they end up getting arrested by the New Orleans Police Department. So it's a fascinating story. And it definitely has some moral challenges that kind of go along with it. But I'm looking forward to kind of talking about this one because I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on Hitman. I did not like this movie. I think it is one of the worst, the actual worst movies I have seen in a long time. And wow. I, so I endured Anyone But You. To me, this was even worse than Anyone But You because are I was you like, kidding? I just, <laughs> why? Look, I don't know Glenn Powell, I don't know him as an individual. <laughs> And I don't like to make comments on actors as people, but his is a face that I feel like we have reached saturation point with in some respect with these whole bunch of different movies that are coming out right now. And this movie relies on you having some kind of buy-in to the characters that he's able to bring to life because what he does in this movie is play multiple different versions of Hitman, sure. okay? So he he's pretty much, he's in every single scene. I don't resonate with the way he represents characters on screen at all, I don't think. So I think for go. me, the core issue with this movie is, Glenn Powell. is that there <laughs> is the way Glenn Powell's depicting his characters. Like, I'm just like, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't find you interesting on screen whatsoever. So, and I, but I just thought it was an entirely dumb film. So it's not just that, it's that I just thought this is such a thorough waste of time, I do not understand why you have bothered making this movie. Oh, it's fascinating, because I sit on the opposite end of the spectrum. Because I, I find, because I'm, I, I love Richard Linkletter, I think he's one of the most innovative directors out there. And then also, I am with you, I really have never really connected with Glenn Powell. Even in, I even thought he was one of the weakest links in Maverick, because I think that he has, throughout his career, has tried to become kind of the new Tom Cruise or the new Brad Pitt in a way, and it always feels put on in certain ways. But the thing I loved about this thing with him was that he was playing Gary Larson, who this is a real person, even though there were that there was a fictional fictional aspect to the romantic relationship that he had and also what ended up occurring at the end of the film. But he actually had over 70 convictions based on the, what he was able to do. So it's fascinating that it was based on this kind of true person, this true character. And the thing I found interesting is when I'm watching it, I'm sitting there going, that's Glenn Powell playing Gary, trying to play, especially when he plays Ron, which is Ron is kind of, I, you almost think, oh, that's Glenn Powell. But then you're going, <laughs> going well, but he's actually playing Gary playing Ron. And so it's, this actually made me more of a Glenn Powell fan, mainly because he wrote this stuff. <laughs> with this guy and also they delved into 
And but also the thing I loved how they did, they did it with, I don't even know if they did it intentionally, but they completely dismantled modern philosophy. Wow, how, how did it dismantle modern philosophy? The fact that I see this movie as a trashy waste of time and you're able to highbrow it as something dismantling <laughs> modern philosophy. How did you get there? Maybe he's a philosophy professor. And, and by, at the beginning, he's sitting there and he's, you know, he's quoting all these major philosophers and doing all these, it comes off very credible. But by the end, all of a sudden, he's doing this motivational talk. You just go out and be who you're going to be, you know, kind of yeah. stuff. And I'm going, wait a minute, you know. And so within that, it opens the door wide for where do you find your morality? Where do you find where you believe? How it is that, who it is that you know? So for me, it actually did open the door and give me an opportunity to be able to talk about all of these great topics. It did turn me from being kind of anti-Glenn Powell to all of a sudden being mm. a Glenn Powell a fan. But I said, I definitely go, okay, the guy's actually got some street cred. He actually pulls off some of these characters. They're really quite funny, some of them. All in all, I really found it quite entertaining. So the, I don't know, the Hitman actually he did make it onto my watch list, I, but Isn't I have a feeling he, it didn't make it onto yours. Well, I'm glad. I love that you loved it. I'm glad this movie mattered to someone, Rust, and that that was you. And look, I'll give it, I'll give it one win. I'll give you one win for this movie for me. And that was the fact that whether you were believed to be a like super suave hitman character or an absolute total dork all comes down to clothing and hairstyle because suddenly like you either think that glenn powell is all that or oh my goodness he's such an ag literally based on costume choice so that's my one maybe win about this is that it's like hey if we all have a glow up our whole lives <laughs> we might be interpreted right. differently